had a chef lined up. Uh, the chef had to roll out at the last minute, but um, Devin's um, surveyed some other chefs, and he can tell us what he learned and, uh, and then the feedback from the chef. Good. Well, I actually talked with three restaurants and a couple independent chefs, and every single one of them was dealing with some sort of staffing issue and that sort of thing. So, um, unfortunately, they couldn't couldn't be here. But um, what I did do is just kind of get inside the mindset of why they wanted to buy and use maple syrup. I mean, they're spending a lot of money. Um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, Canlis had just, I had called them and they were like, what do you got? What do you got? What do you got? I said, well, you know, we have about 40 or so gallons of, we'll take it, you know, so, um, so they, they like it and they, they, um, uh, you know, are, are spending good money on it. So why are they, um, wanting to do that? And so, First question that I asked them is, is how are you using big leaf syrup, you know, in your restaurant? And um, so I got ans I got responses from Canlis. I got responses from uh, a chef named Nels, who's a phenomenal chef. He used to, he was the original uh, chef that I met with when he worked at Canlis. And uh, so he really helped, um, you know, spread the word and, and, and get the excitement around the restaurant industry with it. And then another chef named Doug, who was um, chef at, uh, oh gosh, Chrysalis in Bellingham. Go ahead. Right. So Canlis is uh, a, a pretty upscale restaurant um, that uh gosh they've been there since i think late 70s early 80s or something but um in west seattle ish area um right by uh highway 99 right where uh the the bridge is from oh now my mind's going blank sorry um uh, yes free uh yeah right uh, clean they're on the clean side. Right, 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 right. Yeah, they're they're right before the bridge gets started on the right. No, you're lo that would be cheap. <laughs> so yeah. So the, the, like I said, the first question is I, I asked is how, how do you use big leaf syrup? And uh, Canlis, this is this is what they said that they they do with their syrup. Uh, we use it in sweet and savory applications. It is currently on our snack board, which consists of three bites each. Um, three bites each guest gets at the beginning of their meal. We glaze Japanese style custard with a maple and tamari glaze. And and then topped with smoked mushrooms, our thought process is to use as much natural sugar. And that's one of the things that they had mentioned is they replaced all of their refined sugar with uh, the maple syrup. So uh, their, their demand was pretty high for, for quantities. Um, our thought process is to use as much natural sugar on our menu as possible so that... Uh, email spilled something here so that is a reason why we love mo local maple syrup we are currently developed more ways to utilize maple uh, like a brine in uh, for smoking our fish um, and then Nels who used to work at Canlis a few years ago uh, we use it mostly as a background sweetener and sauces as well in a few desserts as well as an additive for coffee a lot of you probably here do that and it's I can't drink my coffee without it so um, and our bar team uh, has really become interested in it and that's a lot of uh, if if you guys you know locally that's one avenue that you can 
look for as an outlet as you start to produce more maple syrup is go find um, places that do use it in the bar because you know a lot of places if they haven't one of the things that I found is if they haven't heard of the West Coast maple syrup or whatever and you walk in and, and share uh, the, the product with them and, and, and then share the price a lot of times they're like ah, that's just a little you know but the bars, because of the prices of their drinks and stuff and the uniqueness that it adds to a lot of their drinks, that's a that's a good inlet for a lot of sales of maple syrup. So keep that in mind as you're as you're going out. Um, a lot of those really boutique, you know, neat areas that are, you know, anywhere from 40 to $100 a plate probably would bring it in, especially when they hear you're making maple syrup right here in washington and it's an excellent you walk into a restaurant you can get a start a conversation started with any chef and any bartender in there when they find out that you're making it in washington because they're just it's such a curiosity factor um and chrysalis was using it i used it in many forms whether it be for various desserts savory dishes salad dressings uh vegetable flavorings all of which brought out the uniqueness of the product that it is. Um, and so that, um, uh, so there's a lot of wide range. There's probably another five or 10 chefs that I could have got talked to that would have had variances in what they use it for. So there is definitely a wide palette of, of where they find uniqueness of using it. So any thoughts, questions, there they go. Okay. Um, second question that I asked is um, because you know, you know it, it is an expensive product. So I did ask, uh, you know, you pay a large premium for big leaf syrup. Why was it special, and why not just use a, a maple syrup from the East Coast? And uh, so Canlis had said, our priority is to source from Washington as much as possible, and that lends back to what I had mentioned of this. We have a very unique uh, food area that is a little bit pretentious, but also on the cutting edge of, of pretty unique products and, and very uh, eager to use local products um, instead of the cheapest products that they can find, which is, which is great. Um, our priority is to source from Washington as much as possible. And we think this is one of the coolest products being produced in the state right now. On top of that, it is delicious and has a unique flavor compared to other large grade A maple syrup. <laughs> um, so, and, and Nels had said, uh, the locality, the novelty, exclu exclusivity was a big one for him. Um, and innovation all played factors in why they're willing to pay such a premium. And then uh, Doug from Chrysalis had said, the price was definitely more than East Coast sugar, um, but the flavor profile is less sweet, more well-rounded, slightly smoky, and less pungent, which I enjoyed being able to harness a more delicious and delicate note to the dishes that I used it in. It was worth every penny that we paid for it. Um, and then I had also asked, uh, do you share the story of the, the local maple syrup with your customers um, that was integrated with your culinary creations? What was their response? Um, Canlis had said, uh, storytelling is a huge part of our service and we love to share the unique products that are delicious and regional with our guests. Most guests are surprised to learn that we have maple syrup produced in the state um, from our own trees. And that right there was a lot of what helped build moving when we were talking about the market factor going from, you know, all of the restaurants that we were working with. They're the best storytellers out there because they're, you know, charging these customers hundreds of dollars per plate. So they have to elaborate every everything and every sensation that's coming out on these plates. So it, it really lended to that um, aspect of, of their storytelling as they're serving these dishes. That led to, and I noticed as we got canless and 
um, other chefs I got calls from, and then it just kind of led to, you know, 10 or 15 restaurants using it. And that was all that we could produce to keep up with just those guys alone. But then from there, what started to happen is as those dishes came out and they're like, wow, you know, we started getting a lot of those emails that said, you know, hey, we had dinner at so-and-so and we heard, where can we buy some, you know, ourselves? And we didn't have any more to sell. So we just started, you know, building up an inventory list. And then that was the transition that went from, you know, as, as COVID and all of the restaurants got shut down and we had that time frame of, of continuing to produce. And it was a matter of one email. And like I said, it just spawned into, you know, uh, now selling out directly online. So that's the other thing that I want to emphasize to everybody here is, you know, we're, we're servicing a market right now that has a hundredfold capacity to absorb, you know, the more maple syrup. So, um, it's, it's definitely a, a, a great market right now for, um, additional potential. Uh, Uh, Nels had said, um, similar to what, what Canlis had said, and, uh, you know, customers were extremely intrigued by the story um, of, you know, maple syrup produced locally with our own trees. And then uh, Doug had said, all of the customers that I shared the story with uh, deeply appreciated the fact, the fact of where it came from and the effort that it took to get it from the trees to the table. They were all super enthusiastic and a great majority of them wanted to find out how to get their hands on some of it. Um, and then uh, the last question that I asked is, uh, do you see expanded viability of big leaf syrup in the restaurant industry? And uh, Canlis had said 100%, we see it as a necessity, necessity to expand in the restaurant industry. We want the Pacific Northwest to have its own completely sustainable food scene like you see in Japan and Italy, things like big leaf maple syrup, Rock Ridge Creek orchards, apple balsamic are at the beginning of that dream for us, pushing the bar on what is locally produced, sustainably pr practice is what we at Canlis want to challenge the rest of the region to do. So, and that, that message that he just shared is you know, for, for a huge niche of restaurants that have that same, uh, ideology. Um, there's, there's um, from, from the Canadian border down to far past Portland, there's, you know, a ton of restaurants that, um, would love to absorb more maple syrup that we just haven't been able to produce ourselves. So, um, uh, Uh, Nell said, uh, perhaps uh, Canlis is a rare exception. I'm not sure which is the ability desire to offer something truly unique to its customers. So I guess he's kind of trying not to speak for other restaurants. But as long as everyone knows and believes they have a great product, then there's always a way for it to uh, catch on further. Um, Doug mentioned... I see easily that people, chefs, bartender in the industry would have much interest in being able to get their hands on this product and doing many creation, creative things with it. I'm looking forward to be able to uh, add it to a lot of my next adventures. I was able to uh, match it with many different proteins, vegetables, sauces, desserts, and was always elated at the end results and the profile it brings and all the uses that I had for it. Customers were elated, um, you know, what it brought to the meals that they had. So, um, yeah, I think, like I said, um, you know, all of these restaurants had a very similar message about, you know, maple syrup itself and why they were willing to pay for it at that, you know, level. And, 
um, or, you know, at a premium like that because it really lended to the uniqueness of their products and they knew it was, you know, fairly exclusive. And even if all of us turned on our spigots is, you know, to 100%, we couldn't, you know, produce all of the uh, available distribution that I think is available, whether it be wholesale or direct to customers. Um, I mean, we tell customers all year long that I have to respond to that, you know, we've sold out for the season. And then, you know, I always send them a link at the bottom that's, you know, kind of a waiting list. And it's a very, very long list at this point. So um, we're, we're very eager to, to produce more syrup and start meeting that higher demand. So um, any thoughts, questions? Yep. Have you ever had Oh, absolutely. Um, so Herb Farm, which is another you know, probably even higher dollar plate than Canlis, um, which is in Woodenville next to, I forget the name of the hotel that's next door to them. You remember what that is? <laughs> right. Um, but what, what they did is, so with, with our RO, we were able to uh, concentrate it to a certain uh, bricks that they wanted it at. So like the chef would say, um, you know, hey, can we get it at this bricks or, or whatever? And they, they made two products that were more on the sap side. One was they did a fermented uh, kind of a cider. And it was really interesting because it was very dry. Like I've never drank something. It actually felt dry going down. It was really interesting, but it tasted great. Um, that was really unique. And so I've been able to share that story with m more individuals, um, uh, restaurants and, and such. And then they also did, we sent them a 25% or 20%, somewhere around there. And they, and they just put in a sorbet machine and turned it into a sorbet. And it was a huge hit. So they did that for, but they do really unique menus where they're always changing. So they did a whole cycle with that, and it was a really big hit. Um, I just, honestly, I, I, I just reverse engineered the price of the constant of, of full sap minus the, the lack of concentration and, and sold it to them at the same per ounce price with the unconcentrated ratio mixed in. So. Uh, so, yeah, so when we concentrated it, you know, I would just go, we, on my side, it's kind of worked out because I have a really big walk-in cooler on my side of the processing unit. So, so there's the, the big leaf and then on the other side of the wall, there's my WSDA unit, which, you know, and so I have a big walk-in cooler so we can store you know, drums of sap or, or concentrated syrup in there to, to keep it cold. So I would just keep it cold in there till we needed to take it down. And we did a lot of distribution runs every week, so we were able to get it to them pretty early. Yeah, I just looked at the candy maker up north in Seattle, and they make maple or fuchsia cups. Huh. Right. Addition. Yeah. So there are opportunities in restaurants, candy makers that don't think that there's any limit to it because just when you think, oh, that's the that's the end of the tunnel for Yeah. Yeah, we have a pretty big list of folks um, that, you know, uh, oatmeal makers that want like a you know local granulated sugar uh, uh, granola we get a lot of local granola makers you know and they, these are there's a lot of really boutique purveyors throughout the Seattle area and so um, they're always looking for something to give them an edge um, so um, and and you know honestly there's enough people that I'll never be able to serve and enough and a lot of variations of products that I'm not really interested in just because we have so much demand in other areas. 
that, you know, if somebody's producing enough bulk, I'd be happy to, you know, send them, you know, granola makers and, you know, people wanting all kinds of stuff. So, um, yeah, there's also, oh, another one that I get a lot is uh, corporate gifts. They want something more unique. Uh, one of the things that we got really good feedback, like when we'd go to dinner parties and stuff, I'd always bring a bottle of maple syrup instead of a bottle of wine. And there, that was always at least a good portion of the chatter that night of, whoa, this is so unique. So there's that. But also, I get a, I've gotten multiple requests, so I, I'm sure this could be a very expanded niche, is um, hotels that want to leave a unique gift for their customers. So the little two ounces we, uh, when when I when I told Neil and my mom that I wanted to put out a two ouncer and we were going to charge eight dollars a bottle for it, they basically were like, no, nope, that's not going to work. No, nope, that's not going to work. And we sell out of that so fast. It's we will get people ordering fifteen bottles of it, and it's just like blows my mind. Full time. Uh, okay, we did raise it. I raised it this year from three dollars an ounce to three fifty an ounce, and we added the two ouncer for four dollars an ounce. So we did we did raise it this year. When we were selling wholesale to the restaurants, we first went to market at two dollars an ounce, and Neil just about had a heart attack thinking we'll never sell any syrup, <laughs> and, now we, and we couldn't keep it in stock. Um, so we, we went to restaurants at $2 an ounce, and the last round of syrup that I sold, which was, you know, that, uh, I, I don't know what the, we call it cooking syrup, you know, for baking cookies, and we just kind of try to describe it to customers that want, um, you know, syrup that's kind of hitting that molasses stage where it just, what's that? Robust, robust right? Um, I told Neil we just need to put a get a new label and call it Special Dark and people will pay even more for it. <laughs> right. <laughs> so right out yeah, ultra ultra special dark, uh, <laughs> right? Um, but uh, so two two fifty an ounce is what we sold it to, um, and I you know it was finally I I didn't even think of that product in the attic when can't because they've been bugging me and they've been bugging me and they're like you know anything and they're and they said well we'll just go onto your website and we'll pay full retail for it that's 350 an ounce that they were more than happy to pay for so the demand and desire for finding these right restaurant customers is is an extremely viable market for um you know did getting your maple syrup sold, hotels, gifts, um, other purveyors and food makers and stuff. So there's a there's a lot of options out there. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Uh, yes. So, yeah, the, you know, the, the biggest one for us was when NPR came out and did a big story. That one, um, I think we probably had probably 250 emails a day for about a week and a half. And there's probably emails I still haven't gotten back to. Um, and then uh, we probably, for about two weeks, got a phone call after that article for probably every few minutes for a couple weeks. Um, so for for quite a few weeks after that one, um, you know, it was phone ringing off the hook and, and emails because people were so intrigued that you were doing it. And we had a similar effect. So you can see it's it's neat. Because, you know, being a marketer, I have a lot of, you know, 
analytics and stuff plugged into our websites and you you definitely see the spikes for sure you know we had 25,000 visitors the day after i think um uh the the king five one and uh, i mean that's a lot of traffic for you know a, a small business and that's that's the one thing that i would emphasize is we're at a stage right now where still even today the awareness is not saturated so the opportunity for anybody that's got 500 trees a thousand trees you know couple thousand trees is the there's more than enough market share to absorb more than what all of us could produce in this room right now which is which is really cool so <laughs> so you you wouldn't be the first trust me <laughs> Mm. Right. And having available um, a native tree that is wonderful sweetener that uh, has, you know, the minerals and, and things that, that you find cane sugar just doesn't have. Right. Uh, is, is really important and to make um, sweeteners such as the Yeah. And changing the palate of, of the general population because we're so addicted to that. We can find white sugar. Right. That that is another. That's a great, excellent point, and we get a lot of emails back from folks going. I just love the fact that I found a natural sweetener that's made right in our backyard. We get an e we get a lot of emails like that. Um, no, because we're not selling cane sugar. So, <laughs> uh, not yet, but I'll keep my eye out for it. Right. Oh, I, 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 I did the sugar detox with my wife, and for three days it felt like I was detoxing off, you know, being a drug addict. It was bad. I was, I was in bed for headaches and sweating for days. It's you should try it. it but once you're past it, your whole craving palate just it changes 100%. It's, it's a really, you know. Um, I should have stayed off it, but. <laughs> right. I use maple syrup for pretty much everything that I do. And I've, you know, I didn't know a whole lot about culinary aspects before getting into this industry, just the whole food kind of industry six, seven years ago. Um, but I've absorbed a lot of, you know, just through, you know, uh, and that, you know, the other thing too is building the relationships. Like if you're going to work with these restaurants and things like that is build a valuable relationships with the sous chefs and chefs. And, um, because once, once you do that, um, they want you to come by rather than because when you walk into a busy kitchen, um, you can tell when there's a uh, somebody bringing a delivery and the kitchen's bustling and there's a vibe you can feel in the room that there the, the delivery guy's a little bit of an annoyance because he's in people's way and they're trying to get something done. But if you've built a relationship and you smile at the people when you walk in and you like even even to the guy that, you know, might be making bread on the way out, I'll be like, oh, my gosh, that smells so amazing. That's, you know, blah, you know, start a conversation. 
they they you start to change the dynamic of you're the one that's welcome no matter how busy they are and they'll always stop to be like hey check out what i'm doing or hey the, you know da, 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 da. it makes such a huge difference and that's one of the things that i think you know has really allowed us to um take over um, and, and be a valuable, um, you know, product for so much of these restaurants. And I was telling somebody earlier, um, you know, from a sales perspective, being able to build those relationships makes such a huge impact. The first, you know, one of the products that got us in the door to a lot of these restaurants, as I mentioned earlier, was the rabbits that we did. And, uh, you know, building that relationship with these with these restaurants and and stuff. So the the other meat company, and I'm just I was just a small farm, right? And we we launched a pretty big um, a production of rabbits, but the company that currently sold rabbits through Portland and through uh, Seattle, you know, they were a 50, 60, 70 million dollar company. And at 100% of the market share, within one year, I had taken 90% of the market share for that product from them by doing nothing more than building the right relationships. And it, I wasn't just selling them a product. I was selling them because all of these chefs would come up and the uniqueness of our farm was we raised the animal because we were fully vertically integrated from front to back. That animal got raised and it got delivered there to their door from our farm. Nobody else touched the product. And so we raised the product. We made a very custom, we built a, a full feed mill on our farm that was a very, it took me two years to design the ration by, you know, studying animal feed and all this stuff. And I had this big story and pitch and, and it was, it was valid and it was there and it was a unique, um, uh, uh, product, but the fact that we also did all of the humane slaughter right on site, it went into our coolers, it went packed in our facility, and it drove down to their restaurant in our vans um, was a game changer for them because they know what the meat industry is like, you know, and, and all these middlemen and all the stories are you, most of the stories in the food industry, even with this hoity toity mentality, it's all BS. So you'd have the underbelly of this hoity toity market has still has a ton of BS in the market. The chefs know it. Um, most of the people know it, but you know, the, the customers often don't. So, but that was the thing is I didn't want to be BS. So they'd come up for tours and see the whole kit and caboodle and uh, just having a unique product for front to back. And, and that was that model when Neil said, you know what, I'm going to go for it because, you know, he kind of snickered when I said, you know what, I'm going to launch a rabbit product. I think there's a big demand for it. And he's like, rabbits what the heck do you know about raising rabbits you know i was like yeah i know but I'll, I'll learn i'll figure it out you know and and we did and and you know we took that market share and he was re that was about two years that we did that and year three he just was kind of like wow this is you know we went from uh year one traveling around finding really good genetics to um after 12 months, just the rabbits alone, we're doing about $130,000 a year with rabbits. And so that kind of blew him away and gave him the confidence to say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out and I'm going to do this. And so that's the kind of same mentality that we built into that. And, and when chefs come and visit and they go and we take them into, you know, our little sugar bush, and you know they see all the lines and then it comes to the the pump house and then it gets pumped into the tanks goes into the concentrator goes into the evaporator goes to the filter and goes to the bottle and sees just that whole chain it's it's exciting them for them to come see these unique food products so um that alone right there building those foundational blocks so that you're not just another you know, food, you know, business was what allowed them to want to participate, whether it be rabbits or bison or, 
you know, our eggs or whatever it is, or our maple syrup, and pay much higher margins than most even organic farms uh, because the story was so unique. And, and that passion that got transferred to them got transferred to their customers because they understood the passion that went into it was transferred to them, which got the customers excited that, you know, they're going to spend $300 for their dinner, right? That it's, you know, so it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a chain that, you know, um, especially when you're looking at it from a sales and marketing perspective to really, um, understand that value and that ideology that you really want that customer to have and and not just to come up with a story but actually back that story up with something exciting that they want to participate in so uh, do you know how the uh, glycemic index of between maple compares to uh, if it's not maybe the OSU and the guys have a food science program so they we can find out if they and the lower glycemic index because I think uh, maple syrup is lower than sugar, but not as low as agave. Right. Uh, mine is that right? Yeah. Okay. So if, if you can find a niche like that, or make low carb maple syrup, if you make ten dollars an ounce. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I. Uh, we've we've made it. Um, it's with the amount of sap that we have to concentrate, and then go into syrup. Um, we tend to have a little bit darker, and it might be you know some scenarios with like our RO not being able to get you know uh, as as concentrated as, as a bricks before we start cooking the sap, but. We have a little bit, we tend to be a little bit darker and it tends to, I mean, maybe Mike can talk to this too, but we always, it would be a little more, it wouldn't get as granular as we like because the beginning of starting to go towards sugar with those darker syrups, it was a lot harder to try to. Right. 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 And and we have been successful with um, some of our lighter versions, and I that's you know. Right. <laughs> right. 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 And that's that's exactly why we didn't worry about making sugar too much. So one of the things that I am excited about, too, is, you know, some of the, uh, you know, seltzer or, you know, some of those aspects, too, because um, at least on paper, it seems like the math will pencil out to be a lot higher, you know, um, revenue without going all the way down to syrup for some of the products as well, but we uh, haven't gotten there yet. So, okay, <laughs> and that's a wrap. All right. I don't know about you, but I'm tired. <laughs> We're then I'll open up the Maple Bar for an hour and shutting down at nine <laughs> tonight, so everybody can get a good night's sleep. Um, Devin, thank you so much. Um, several people expressed surprise to me that you were so sharing. They're like, he's giving away all his trade secrets. <laughs> so we really appreciate it. Thank you very much.